Hello and welcome to American Catholic History, brought to you by the support of listeners like you. If you value this content, please become a supporter at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Once again, a word of thanks to our supporters, especially Father Said, Laura K, Andrew M, Kathleen K, Michael M, Mary G, Teresa C, and Martin K. Thank you to everyone who has supported our work. Yes, thank you sincerely. We're still about 34% of the way to the amount of support we need to really do everything we'd like to do with this content and keep it going on a more regular basis. So if you've enjoyed these episodes, if you've learned something, if you've been inspired or edified, please consider becoming a supporter. You can learn about our support tiers at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support. The lowest is just $5 each month. But for more each month, you'll get extra perks. Yeah. Also, thank you for your very kind reviews and five-star ratings. Yes, those help others find us, and we really do appreciate hearing ways our work has helped you, your kids, your students, your parish, whatever. Thank you, and please keep them coming. So, all that said, on with the show. Today, we're talking about Mother Mary Elizabeth Lang, the foundress of the first religious order for Black people in America, the Oblate Sisters of Providence. Mother Lang was really the right person in the right place at the right time. Yeah, that kind of sounds providential. (laughs) Doesn't it? So it sounds like the name of her order was perfect. Yep, pretty much. But she really was just the right person in the right place at the right time. She was a free black woman in a slave state in the decades before the Civil War. She was not a native-born American. She was well-educated, and she started out her adult life with her own independent wealth from an inheritance. So, yeah, not a typical situation at all. But in the providence of God, she was situated to do amazing things, and she freely chose to do those things for the greater glory of God. And she did it all so well that her cause for canonization is now open, and very rightly so. Hopefully it won't be too much longer before she is raised to the altar and held up as an example for all of us to emulate. So let's talk about this likely saint waiting to be canonized. Yeah, so... Elizabeth Clarice Lang was born somewhere between 1783 and 1794. The records are unsure about her early life. According to one source, she was born in San Domingue, which is more or less modern-day Haiti, the western portion of the island of Hispaniola. The same source says that her mother, Annette Lang, was the daughter of a Jewish plantation owner, while her father, Clovis, was one of the slaves on that plantation. And then, in the early 1790s, Annette fled Saint-Domingue when the slave rebellion broke out in Saint-Domingue. They settled in Cuba, where young Clarice received an excellent education. Now, other sources dispute the birth on Saint-Domingue, saying it is possible, likely even, that she was born in Cuba to French parents. Either way, by the mid-1790s, she was in Cuba, where she received an excellent education. In the early 1800s, she emigrated to the United States, first landing in Charleston, South Carolina, then Norfolk, Virginia, and by 1813, when she was 29, she finally settled in Baltimore, Maryland. Now, remember, South Carolina, Virginia, and Maryland were all slave states. Lots of free blacks lived in those states, but most of the blacks in those states were slaves. What's interesting is that the city of Baltimore at the time, free blacks outnumbered enslaved blacks. And this was in part due to that same revolution in San Domingue that Lang had fled. Many of them came to Baltimore and then settled there. So when she arrived, she was coming to live among her own people in many ways. And what she found there among her own people, as well as other Blacks, was a dire need for education. The situation for the free Blacks wasn't that different from what would happen in New York a few decades later when waves of uneducated and destitute Irish arrived fleeing the potato famine. In New York, it was, of course, the great John Hughes who championed education, In Baltimore, there were a number of Protestant groups that had had open schools already, but the need was much greater than even they could handle. So Lang, well-educated and independently wealthy, took it upon herself to do something about it. Sort of like us, just not independently wealthy. Yeah. (laughs) Sorry. Yeah. (laughs) The year she actually opened her own school is not certain, but it seems like it was about 1818 when she and a friend, Marie Ballas, opened a free school for black girls in her home. They charged no tuition living on Lang's inheritance. 
from what we've seen, it looks like Lang's school was the only one to, that charged no tuition in the town. And there was no free public school available to black children until 1866, which of course was after the Civil War and full emancipation was in effect. But of course, the money didn't last forever. About 10 years in, financial problems began to set in and Lang and Balas needed help. This really is where Providence steps in. Yes, because at about this same time, which is the late 1820s, Father James Nicholas Joubert was looking for some women who could be trusted to start a school for black girls with the support of the archdiocese. Joubert is actually an interesting figure to enter the story at this point. He himself was a refugee from Saint-Domingue, although he wasn't born there. Right. He was born in France in 1777 and grew up there in the midst of the French Revolution. In his early 20s, he got a job as a low-level official in the new French government. In 1800, the French government sent him to be a tax official in Saint-Domingue. But in 1803, that island was again wracked with war, and this time it was directed against the agents of the new French government. So he, with a lot of others, hightailed it out of there, going first to Cuba and then to the United States, settling in Baltimore. He, he actually entered St. Mary's Seminary in 1805. He was ordained a priest in 1810, and he became a member of the Sulpicians, the order that had come from France a decade earlier and had founded St. Mary's Seminary. He spent his priesthood in various capacities at St. Mary's Seminary. One of his tasks was teaching catechism to black children but he found it was very difficult because they couldn't read or write. He brought this problem to Archbishop Whitfield, who encouraged him to find some women who could open a school for black girls to educate them. So it was only natural for Father Joubert and Elizabeth Lang to run into one another. The happy meeting. The providential meeting, you mean? Yes, the providential meeting, which happened in 1828. Elizabeth Lang confided to Father Joubert that she had long considered her life's work to be not only in teaching, but in consecrated life. Father Joubert took her up on both and said he would help to direct the school and raise money, and he would support the formation of a religious community with Lang as the superior. Now, this was radical. Up to this point, no religious communities in the United States accepted black men or women among their number. This would be the first black religious community in the United States. Elizabeth Lang, who had been in the United States for at least 16 years by this point, undoubtedly recognized the opposition she would face. She had certainly faced bigotry and racism plenty of times already, and she knew that that would only get worse as she broke this color barrier. Unfortunately, the bigotry would also come from many Catholics. Catholics, being humans, can also be influenced by their surroundings, so they weren't immune from having their view of race and religion tinged by the institution of slavery. Obviously, it wasn't all Catholics, or even most. Archbishop Whitfield and Father Joubert were white, and they both championed this cause. Father Joubert also had the benefit of being European. Yet we talked in a number of episodes about how Black American Catholics who went to Europe were blown away by how indifferent Europeans were to racial issues. Father Augustus Tolton had this experience in Rome, Claude McKay in Paris, Mary Edmonia Lewis also in Italy, and others. Father Joubert saw them as Catholics, as people who needed education and catechesis. And in many places in the, in the United States, the reason why Blacks weren't in religious communities had at least as much to do with local and state laws that prohibited mixed-race organizations as it did with outright bigotry among Catholics. And the issue of race and racism within the church in America is a complex and thorny topic. It's actually something we deal with and talk about a bit during our pilgrimage to the Kentucky Holy Land and Bourbon Country, because that area, as amazing as it is, had some parts of our history that we're less than proud of. But also some great examples of Catholics living in harmony, regardless of race. Right. Father Baden, Daniel Rudd. It's a fascinating microcosm of the church in America. Speaking of which, seats are filling up for that pilgrimage this coming August, so don't miss out. Get information about that amazing trip on our website and sign up soon. Space is limited. <laughs> That's true. Fewer than 10 spots available left, right? right? Mm -hmm. All right, plug aside, let's move on with the story of Mother Elizabeth Lang. Yes. The next part is the formation of the religious community. 
On July 2nd, 1829, Elizabeth Lang and three other women, including Marie Ballas, took their vows, and the Oblate Sisters of Providence were born, with Elizabeth Lang as the superior. Lang herself took Mary as her religious name. That made her forever known as Mother Mary Lang. The first paragraph of the rule read as follows. The Oblate Sisters of Providence are a religious society of virgins and widows of color. Their end is to consecrate themselves to God in a special manner, not only to sanctify themselves and thereby secure the greater glory of God, but also to work for the Christian education of colored children. Their work as a religious community continued with the education of children, but it included a number of other ministries. They took in the elderly indigent. They helped nurse the ill during the cholera epidemic of 1832. To support themselves and their work with the children, they did a number of things to make money. They took in laundry and sewing work. They worked as domestics at St. Mary's Seminary. They made vestments. And yes, they'd go out begging for support to help the children see that relying on charity and begging for support has its own dignity. The school they operated eventually became known as St. Francis Academy. Their programs expanded to include vocational training and other classes for older women. They even opened homes for widows and orphans. Those intrepid women overcame significant odds. In addition to the expected poor treatment due to racism and bigotry, they had to find a new clerical champion every few decades. In 1843, Father Joubert died, and the Sulpicians decided not to continue ministering to the Oblates. Which, while unfortunate for the Oblates, made sense because the Sulpicians' primary work was the education of priests. Father Joubert took on the Oblates as a personal ministry, and his superiors allowed it, but it didn't fit with the Sulpician charism as a long-term project. Yeah, it does seem reasonable, even if it was a tough pill to swallow for the Oblates. But after four years of struggle without a clerical champion, the Redemptorists took on the Oblates in 1847. With the Redemptorists involved, the Oblates established another school for girls, St. Michael, as well as a school for boys, St. Joseph. But the Redemptorists ended their involvement in 1860. In 1863, the Jesuits took them on, and it was under the Jesuits that they began to establish schools in other cities and other states. These ups and downs came with an ebbing and flowing of fortunes. There were times when the order had no idea how it could keep going. The number of students shrank to almost none at times, and they endured the loss of some very important sisters who went off to found their own orders in other places. Mother Lang served as the Mother Superior a few different times, as well as the Novice Master. For 53 years, she did whatever was necessary to help the children and keep the schools and the Oblates going. Yes, she taught, she worked, she prayed, she begged, and and when one of the sisters died, Mother Lang took on the work as a domestic at St. Mary's Seminary. She simply did whatever needed to be done and whatever the order required of her to serve souls. And she kept at it until February 3rd, 1882, when she died peacefully. But her legacy lives on. According to the Oblate Sisters website, the order currently has 80 members. They still operate St. Francis Academy in Baltimore, as well as schools in Miami, Florida and Buffalo, New York as well as two schools abroad in Costa Rica. In 1991, William Cardinal Keeler, Archbishop of Baltimore, formally opened the cause of canonization for Mother Mary Lang. The cause continues to be championed by Cardinal Keeler's successor, Archbishop William Laurie. Just last year, as the Archdiocese of Baltimore recognized the 140th anniversary of her death, he said to the Catholic Review Archdiocesan newspaper, quote, I think we should all pray earnestly for her beatification and eventual canonization. The more I learn and have learned about Mother Lang, the more I'm convinced she is absolutely worthy. Based on her life of service and patience, wholly dedicated to spreading the gospel and considering her grace in the face of such great odds and terrible mistreatment, we heartily agree. This has been American Catholic History. If you enjoy American Catholic History, please become a supporter. We've got great perks for supporters. Get information on how to become a supporter and the perks at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support. Also on our website, sign up for our newsletter. Learn more about Mother Mary Lang. See about our pilgrimages, like our pilgrimage to the Kentucky Holy Land and Bourbon Country. And find other great stories from American Catholic History. 
We also love the great reviews our listeners leave. We've gotten some really heartfelt notes lately. So thank you to those of you who have left reviews or sent us emails. Those in the five-star ratings really help uh, help to raise us up in the searches and the rankings. If you'd like to contact us, you can send us feedback, questions, tips for episode topics, and other comments at feedback at americancatholichistory.org. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash American Catholic History, on Instagram at ACH underscore podcast, and follow us on Twitter at ACH1513. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History, made possible by listeners like you.